Okay, welcome back, everyone, uh, to our scene representation learning for autonomous driving workshop. Um, I'm the co-organizer of the workshop. My name is Meng Ye Ren. I'm an assistant professor at New York University, and I'm very glad to introduce our uh, afternoon section of the workshop. <laughs> so we will start with a uh, um, invited talk by Jamie Shulton um, from Wave on the topic of uh, learning a globally scalable driving intelligence, and we'll have a uh, contributed talk for n the next hour. We followed by a coffee break for thirty minutes, and then another two invited talk. Uh, first by Dr. Christos Sak Sakaridis from ETH Zurich and another talk by Professor Bo Lee from UIUC. And at 4.30, we'll have a, uh, the awards announcement, and we'll have a panel discussion among all of the invited speakers, uh, and I will also host a panel discussion. So, yeah. So let's please uh, welcome uh, Jamie Shulton's talk. It's a pre-recorded talk, and yeah, you can play. Hello, good afternoon, and I'm delighted to be here uh, at the workshop, uh, remotely at least, talking about embodied AI for autonomous driving. As we drive around the streets of London every day, uh, we see the kind of um, complexity in these urban streets that you see in these example videos here. Buses, uh, uh, undertaking motor, mopeds, uh, zooming all over the place, bicycles, multi-lane roundabouts, uh, buses going down the wrong way uh, of a, a street and more. And it is clear from looking at these uh, examples, just at the enormity of the uh, complexity of the autonomous driving problem. From its inception, WAVE has been approaching the problem of autonomous driving as an embodied AI problem. And in particular, we've been working on AV 2.0, an adaptive and scalable driving intelligence that generalizes to new cities, countries, and driving cultures, that is vehicle and sensor agnostic, and that learns driving policies that align with human driving. As an example of the power of this, last year we took our driving models that had been trained only in London and uh, took them on a road trip across the UK to a bunch of different uh, cities. And lo and behold, uh, it drove as, it, as you'd expect. It had never been trained in these cities. It never had seen these. It didn't have any HD maps of these areas, but we were able to take a policy trained in London uh, of our AV 2.0 generalized driving intelligence and apply it in Cambridge, Coventry, Liverpool, Leeds, Manchester. Since then, we've been working on generalizing uh, our driving technology across vehicle. And so here is uh, the, the Jaguar I-Pace that we use and this Maxus van uh, that we have built. And again, last year we showed that uh, the same driving intelligence model could generalize across these different uh, vehicle platforms. So in this little sped up video, you see in the top row, the, uh, the view from our autonomous car, and uh, below it, you see the view um, from the autonomous van driving using exactly the same uh, neural network driving po policy, navigating the complex uh, streets and intersections of London fully autonomously. We were also very privileged recently to host Bill Gates. And this is a, uh, a clip from uh, the video that uh, is out on YouTube and you can have a look at it in more detail if you'd like. But he had an absolute whale of a time. We demonstrated uh, complex driving behavior uh, through central London on routes we'd never driven before. And uh, the seeing you know pretty intense and complex uh, scenarios such as what we just uh, witnessed there. And more recently, we've uh, been working with our partners, Ocado and Asda, and just launched a few weeks ago, uh, an actual uh, autonomous driving delivery of groceries in London with Asda. And one of the unique things about that is it's 
a, a very large set of uh, postcodes in the UK. So unconstrained ODD, um, we do still have a safety driver in the vehicle for now, but it's very, very exciting to see this technology be able to scale in a way that supports as does business uh, without them needing to completely change how they operate. I want to spend a few minutes thinking about, uh, stepping back for a moment and thinking about uh, the breakthroughs we've seen in AI over the last few years. Um, it has been really a, a phenomenal time uh, in AI and uh, very, very exciting and breakthrough after breakthrough has come. And I want to think about where this is coming from, what's, what's been driving this. Um, before we do, I mean, you know, you all know these, right? Uh, the ability now where ImageNet is considered a solved problem, where ChatGPT is talked about everywhere um, by everyone, not just people in AI, where, you know, big complex games that were believed to be beyond uh, computers are, are falling game after game and where we see fo uh, the, the pro protein folding problem completely solved with, uh, with things like AlphaFold. Um, it has been an incredibly exciting time. So what's underpinning this? Well, several things. First of all, I think uh, large training data sets and benchmarks have allowed us to solve non-toy problems. Uh, benchmarks have set up competitions, and this has led to a really fast uh, feedback cycle in the community. The use of games and simulation has allowed uh, a lot of reinforcement learning, self-play, again, rapid iteration and fast feed feedback cycles when it comes to decision-making AI. Self-supervised learning has been a major, major breakthrough of the last few years that it essentially allows us to learn from unlimited quantities of unlabeled data. Previously, you'd have to label these, these data, this data and that's expensive, slow and, and constraining. We've seen the emergence of foundation models that take some of those, uh, those large, uh, the, the large models that have been trained with unsupervised learning, but show that you can use them in task, ag task agnostic ways. You can pre-train a foundation model and then use it either through fine tuning or prompting to do a number of different tasks. Of course, all of this has been underpinned by scalable compute. Uh, that have allowed us to scale up models and data and, and again, iterate fast. But more recently, scalable architectures, transformers, of course, uh, and variants thereof. Um, and those architectures being deployed at scale. And, and then we see things like emergent properties at larger scale and uh, scaling curves, scaling laws that allow us to, to predict um, how these models are going to work as we change uh, scale. Another one that has surprised uh, some people, I think, including myself, is, is multimodality and the, the, the rapid use of these general purpose uh, transformer architectures to be able to bring together different, uh, different disciplines, NLP, vision, uh, audio, et cetera, and, and the, the, the amazing things that we're starting to see out of, out of that, grounding language with, with images, for example. And this also offers really efficient learning of concepts and reasoning. A picture is worth a thousand words after all. And perhaps the most recent uh, big breakthrough that has really unlocked things like ChatGPT has been uh, the ability to, to use human feedback to align with human goals pre and preferences. Um, and what this really allows us to do is learn from unlimited noisy uh, corpora, corpora of data out in the wild, which, you know, on their own are pretty, pretty useless, but allow you to learn these concepts. And then you can fine tune those in a way that gives you something actually useful that is acceptable to, uh, to, uh, you know, to human use. And, you know, putting it all together, it looks a bit like this. So it really has been this incredible journey over the last uh, five or 10 years. Um, and seems to be accelerating every day. So what's next? I mean, this is what's happened already. At Wave, we believe the next major uh, inflection point in AI is going to be embodied intelligence. We are looking at uh, autonomous driving, of course, but there are many, many 
uh, applications or uh, embodied AI that will it require these embodied agents, these robots, uh, quadcopters, etc., to have an understanding of how the world works, how things move, how people react to those uh, those things, uh, and to be able to deal with the open world complexity that's out there. I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, four areas uh, of, of many others that we're looking at at WAVE um, and uh, some of the exciting work that's going on. So let's start with uh, simulation for evaluation. And this really plays on these first two um, uh, concepts I talked about, the, the concept of benchmarks um, that have allowed rapid progress in computer vision and NLP um, and games and simulation. So when it comes to testing an autonomous vehicle, uh, that you can do things like open loop, log replay testing, and that does get you somewhere. But really the, the, the thing you really want to know is how does the system work in a closed loop? Of course, the ultimate test is real world testing, and that's always going to be a, uh, a, an important part of verifying that the whole system works as a whole. But of course, this is safety critical. It's expensive, slow, and noisy. To get the rapid iteration cycle that we've seen in, uh, in computer vision, for example, uh, simulation offers a much, much faster test bed to iterate in. It's cheap, it's repeatable, it's scalable. You can explore counterfactuals. What if something changed in the, in the scene? You can test things that are too dangerous to test uh, in the real world. But of course, it's got to be realistic enough. You have this domain gap between the simulator uh, and the real world. And that's not just a visual gap, it's uh, the physics, the dynamics, the, the, the multi-agent behavior, uh, etc. So it's a, it's a challenging problem to get all of that right. Wave has recognized this uh, and been working on our Wave Infinity simulator for the last few years. And here's a, a, a quick overview. Uh, at its heart, it's a fully controllable uh, procedural generation of worlds uh, simulator that connects uh, bird's eye view to full 3D worlds, um, populates that uh, with a diversity of agents uh, targeted at the sort of central London ODD, as you can see at the moment, can generate all of the um, perception inputs that we need uh, from the, the various cameras. And even if we want to, we can generate these kind of uh, perceptual labels uh, for, uh, for segmentation or depth, for example. Underpinning this is a generative world creator. Um, and here's a few of the examples, example worlds that come out of this. And the nice thing about this is we can generate as much data as, as we want and test as many scenarios as, as we want. And this allows us to basically be uh, limited by the speed of software um, in how we test things. Additionally, by having such a, a wide variety of tests, we help uh, this helps in terms of domain randomization to help reduce that uh, domain gap. Now, does it work? Well, here's an example where we have taken a one of our driving intelligence models that has been trained only on real world data. So it has never seen our simulator before. It doesn't know about this. It's experiencing the, the real to sim gap um, live. And yet, from just the perceptual inputs, the, 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 the camera inputs that you see on the bottom, um, it is able to uh, navigate and drive this uh, reasonably complex, um, busy uh, urban environment uh, and, and, and do so for you know, uh, a significant extended uh, length of time. And what we find by doing this over many such tests is we get very uh, strongly predictive uh, driving performance in SIM that tells us uh, that is a very, very strong indicator of how well this thing would work in the real, uh, in the real work, in the real road. But of course, what I've shown you has, does have uh, some clear, clear visual uh, domain gaps. Uh, another thing we've been exploring is the use of neural radiance fields, NERFs to re-simulate pockets of the environment. So from a, a clip, as you see in the, the top left of, of real driving data, we can turn that into the, the beautiful 3D reconstruction that you see on the bottom right. Uh, 
And from that, uh, we can do all sorts of fun stuff. So of course, uh, we can replay what uh, the car did. Um, and furthermore, we can start to uh, use the uh, build a semantic segmentation inside that NERF um, that allows us to, um, you know, get this beautiful uh, understanding of, of what's what. Once we've got that, then we can start to actually replay and again, populate this as a simulation with our real driving models and see how they drive around here. And because we have those uh, semantic segmentations, we can detect uh, things like uh, collisions with, with uh, the, 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 the vehicles that are parked here. So exciting progress here, but I think there are so, still, of course, several grand challenges ahead. How do we close that sim to real gap? How do we prove that the simulation is good enough? And how can we marry the best of both worlds between neural rendering and procedural generation? Moving on, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about reinforcement learning for driving. And again, back to our, uh, our menu of, of AI advances, this is very much aligned with the games and simulation one. Now, I'm sure many of you know uh, reinforcement learning. You have uh, an actor that, or a policy that, that acts in an environment, it takes actions, it gets observations from that environment, and importantly, it gets a reward signal about uh, over time. Wave actually started uh, very early on exploring reinforcement learning to, to drive a car. And here's uh, a, a short clip of this, um, where we started on this country road, let the thing explore, um, and uh, a human would take over whenever it uh, was about to crash into the, the wall or run off the road. And uh, if I fast forward the video slightly, you know, you get to the end and it's actually able to drive pretty well. Um, in a relatively uh, small number of, of episodes. But of course, the real world doesn't look like that. And what we really care about is being able to act in a busy urban environment, as you see on the right. Now, RL has, uh, has lots of good properties. It's a little bit like human learning and you can encode human rules and intuition in, uh, in the, the rewards, um, but it is pretty, but, uh, data inefficient and requires exploration in an environment in particular. And of course, in the real world, you cannot allow that kind of exploration that we saw in that, uh, that um, early test uh, a moment ago. So how can you, how can you get over it? Well, simulation to the rescue. We've been working on multi-agent reinforcement learning in simulation for, for urban driving for a little while now, building off the infinity simulator that I showed you earlier, we're able to learn uh, extremely efficiently about 700 times real time um, at, in these dense environments here by using this, uh, by using a very efficient tokenized in, uh, input representation and uh, distributed training architecture. As we've gone about this problem, we've, we've had a few principles that we've tried to follow. We want the agents to act independently as they do in the real world. We want to use a simple set of rewards that lead to emergent and human-like behavior. We'll be continuing to evolve the worlds and the complexity of those worlds and the scenarios we want to be able to drive in. And so we need this system to be able to relearn quickly and adapt to those. And finally, we want a single algorithmic approach that can result in complex multi-agent behavior mainly for, for the ease of development, but because we think it can be, can be done. So this includes both multiple different types of agent, uh, but also for each type of agent, a diversity of agents within that type, both good drivers, bad drivers, and potentially adversarial drivers. As I mentioned, one of the keys to the, the, the rapid progress of this project has been uh, a vectorized representation that, that basically allows us to learn this thing for billions of, of, uh, of episodes uh, in, in a matter of hours. And that's down to a very, very efficient vectorized representation. Once you do that, you start to get some really interesting emergent behavior coming out. So here's a video um, where you'll see uh, the, the car, the ego vehicle uh, giving way and waiting for a, uh, an oncoming vehicle 
uh, to, to pass. This is not something we hand coded. We gave it very, again, very, very simple rewards of the kind, do not crash into anything and make progress towards your goal. Um, another interesting example is, is giveaway behavior. Um, and again, here's a few different scenarios where our, our, the, the agents have been able to learn have very human-like giveaway behavior, again, from relatively simple rewards, um, reward signals. We've also been exploring what we call universal agents, which is basically a single uh, neural network, uh, a single policy that has been trained to be able to, uh, to, to, to act for a diversity of different types of agents. So here, both the ego vehicle and uh, the, uh, the ego bicycle rather, and the, the vehicles around here are being uh, operated by a, a single driving policy, a single universal agent. When it comes to evaluation, one of the interesting use cases of this is actually to populate your world with suboptimal driving. So here's a, a busy intersection where people are not really following the rules of the road kind of deliberately. And uh, you see all sorts of craziness here. Now, would you actually see this this kind of craziness in the in the world? Well, probably not for the cars, maybe for the bicycles. That's, that's not that unrealistic for, for bicycles, at least in Cambridge where I live. And uh, uh, but but importantly, our driving intelligence needs to be able to cope with those kind of crazy uh, scenarios and, and be able to manage that. And so it's important that we're able to generate this kind of behavior. Now, it's all very well using uh, these for evaluation and to populate our, our simulator for, for evaluation. But could we actually learn to drive from these? So far, we've been talking about um, these, these tokenized vector representations that are, are privileged. They have full uh, perceptual state about the, the simulation. Well, can we distill that down to a non-privileged driving policy? And yes, we can, is the answer. So using uh, techniques similar to Zhang et al, we can take, uh, we can learn a policy that can drive from the image that you see in the, the bottom left. Um, and drive pretty much as well as the uh, as the privileged policy uh, again in these in these quite busy complex urban environments. Now this has been great, but there are remain a number of grand challenges here. First of all, and perhaps most impactfully, can we close the sim to real gap? So that these policies these, that we've learned in simulation using RL can be taken onto the road and drive performantly. We've seen the first step of that in terms of the uh, distill distillation to a non-privileged policy, but can we actually take that uh, onto the road and, and cross the domain gap? Can we learn the rewards from a real-world expert, dri expert driving? I mean, they're pretty simple today, but uh, is that going to be scalable enough? And indeed, can we shape these policies with human feedback? If we see this as learn something that's mostly right, but not quite right, uh, can we provide human feedback to improve that? The next topic I'd like to talk about is language meets driving. And uh, this I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about. It's, uh, it's been amazing to see uh, the emergence of increasingly complex understanding of language uh, with these large language models, GPT-1, 2, 3, 4, uh, etc. It, it is, um, but, but moreover, what's, what you're starting to see now is it's not just understanding language, but it's actually understanding how to think and how to reason. Um, and I, I think the opportunity here for multimodality and, and bringing together language and our, our vision, video driving um, and action is, is potentially enormous. So let's start by looking at LLMs out of the box. They already encode a huge knowledge about driving. So for example, you're driving along a road and a ball rolls out in front of you. And what might happen next? Ask ChatGPT and you'll get a pretty reasonable answer. If a ball rolls out into the road in front of you while you're driving, you may have to brake or swerve to avoid hitting it. If you are unable to avoid hitting the ball, it could cause damage to your vehicle or cause you to lose control. 
It's best to drive cautiously and be aware of your surroundings and avoid potential hazards. So pretty reasonable answer, but you can probe a bit further. How would your answer change if you were driving next to a school? Well, then it's even more important to be extra cautious. Children may be present and may not be paying attention to, to traffic. It's crucial to be prepared to stop, um, etc. Is it true still if the time is midnight? Well, if it's midnight, the risk of, of children being present on the road would be significantly lower, but it's still important to be aware of your surroundings and prepared to stop or swerve to avoid hitting objects. So, you know, th this is uh, kind of impressive given this is, you know, not ever seen a real road. It's, it's based purely on text, um, but very, very exciting uh, that these LLMs already encode a huge amount of knowledge about driving. We've been starting to uh, to play around with this and um, seeing uh, at least as a first step, can we get uh, can we can we ground language and the, uh, the, the 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 vision and actions that we see in the world such that we can in interrogate our driving models and see what it understands. And so, you know, this is a little clip of, of driving in simulation for the moment. Um, where we're turning the uh, driving into uh, into text. And so if I pause it here, um, I'll read it out. As we drove, the green compact car in front of us suddenly changed lanes and started moving in our direction. To avoid a collision, I slowed down significantly. Meanwhile, a brown sedan on the left continued moving from left to right, crossing our path. It was a bit tense, but we managed to handle the situation safely. Of course, that's in simulation so far. Um, and to bridge the, the, uh, the gap there, to take it to the real world, we've been starting to explore uh, capturing a, a large corpus of language and driving data uh, of the kind that you see here, where we have our uh, AV safety operators uh, narrating as they, as they drive um, and describing the scene in quite a lot of detail about what's going on, what are the important things to pay attention to, what are the causal factors um, of decision making, etc. We believe that this, this data set is going to be a, a phenomenal resource uh, to enable us to explore um, vision uh, and language grounding. So the grand challenge is here, can we actually do this? Can we ground vision, language and action? Can we learn the rules of the road from written laws, right? In the UK, at least, we have the Highway Code, and that is a, a book that literally writes down the rules of the road. If you could do that, that gives you enormous, uh, you know, rapid means to learn from those written laws. Could you use intervention reports uh, written in natural language to be a source, a rich source of supervision, which again, perhaps tease out the causal factors of what went wrong and why uh, it should have done something differently. Can we exploit the reasoning capabilities that these LLMs seem to have to address the long tail? And can we build confidence, increasing confidence with end-to-end -end autonomous systems through language uh, Q&A? The final section I want to talk about is world models. And this very much aligns with the themes of, of self-supervised learning and, and for, towards foundation models. So it's pretty clear to drive well, you need to be able to predict the future and the different possibilities of, this, of that future. So this white car, is it stationary? Is it in the middle of a turn? Is it, what's it gonna do? Now, if I show you a video, it's, it's a lot clearer that it's actually pretty stationary here, but it still could, there is a possible future where it pulls out suddenly, unexpectedly. And it is important to be aware that that is a, a possibility. World models have been uh, a, a, an exciting topic of, of, of late. Basically, uh, you know, a, a lot of work has, has focused on, on games and learning a generative model of the world dynamics, condition on action um, from data within these games. And then using that world model, that, that uh, world dynamics model to learn a better policy through, for example, model-based model reinforcement learning. We've been excited about this topic for a, a little while now. The last couple of years, we've been working on um, various aspects of world models. So our, our CVPR 21 paper called Fiery uh, worked on the, the new scenes data set and aimed to predict uh, the future evolution, the multimodal future evolution of um, driving in the scene. 
More recently, our work Mile at NeurIPS last year, model-based imitation learning used 3D geometry as an inductive bias and uh, allowed us to build control policies from offline data corpora, corpora that uh, avoided the world on rails assumption, uh, improved the state of the art on the Carla simulator, um, and was able to predict diverse and plausible futures for up to an hour in the future. And, and you can see a, a bit of an example of stable dreaming from this model on the on the right there. That's a top-down view where the uh, the white is the ego vehicle, the blue are the um, imagined uh, vehicles ahead, the red there is a traffic light that then turns green, um, etc. Um, this was a, a, a fairly uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, autoregressive architecture where you could uh, essentially unroll, uh, uh, encode from observation, decode back to uh, another observation or to the um, bird's eye view representation and unroll if you want to, to dream into the future. And so again, we could see multimodal predictions and here the top row shows an example where uh, the traffic light turns red in its imagination and the, the ego vehicle stops. The bottom row shows the uh, vehicle continuing through uh, the light. And uh, of course, we can uh, then drive around in the simulator using this and this improved our driving performance. But Fiery was a supervised approach and Mile only required our simulator, required, required to work in simulation. How can we build a world model that works on real data without supervision? And, uh, you know, taking a, a leaf out of the large language models uh, book, can we auto regressively predict the next frame? And well, the answer is yes. And I'm going to give you a very quick sneak peek of something that we are incredibly excited on and iterating rapidly. This is a, a self-supervised world model that we've, we've uh, generated, and it's going to imagine a driving scene. So the, uh, the top, you see the, the prompt for sort of two seconds, the conditioning, and then the bottom, it's gonna imagine what's gonna continue in the scene uh, as a full, a full video, and it's imagined a right turn. Well, we can move on and do the same again, do another sample from this generative model. And this time, again, we do a right turn, but you'll notice that the, it imagines something completely different, a completely different uh, street scene. And, you know, yet again, let's do another sample. And here uh, it's going to imagine a left turn. We're not conditioning it. It's just uh, deciding to do a left turn when it gets to the end of the road. And lo and behold, you, you get the left turn. Perhaps even more excitingly, you can uh, do the same thing with a, a traffic light. So here's an example where we prompt a busy intersection where the light is red and it imagined the light stays red and there continues to be traffic uh, crossing uh, across the road. But a different sample from this model, uh, you'll see the, the traffic crossing and then the traffic clears and the light turns green and the, uh, the, the, the world model imagines that the, the car drives forward. Um, it's really, really exciting to see this, uh, this ability. So the grand challenge is here. Well, can we control these models through action, language, etc.? And of course, can we integrate these into on-road uh, driving policies? So I'll wrap up there. Thank you for uh, listening. Uh, I, I strongly believe autonomous driving is an embodied AI problem and that the underpinnings of modern AI are accelerating uh, embodied AI now. There are many grand challenges and we've seen some of them and exciting opportunities ahead uh, for further impact. So thank you very much um, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the workshop. Okay, um, so I think Jamie unfortunately cannot make to the workshop for a question and answer uh, section. So next uh, we will have the contributed talk section.